because the Chirac government of France was trying to get hostages out of Lebanon. And the, the mullahs said, well, maybe you'll get them back if you kick the MEK out of France. That's what happened. They were expelled from France, and they fled to Iraq. And Chirac didn't get back all of his hostages. He got some of them, typical uh, treatment from their regime. So this changes the picture rather dramatically. They didn't go to Iraq because they wanted to support Saddam Hussein. They didn't fight in the war. So now ask yourself, when Khomeini was about to die, why didn't the Grand Marshal of Iran, the greatest cleric, Montezeri, become the next supreme leader, as was supposed to be the case? Because he knew they were executing people by the tens of thousands in the summer and fall of 1988. And he complained to Khomeini. How do we know this? His son released all his letters in 2010. The audio tapes of Montezeri's voice came out in 2016. Now the United Nations has ir irrefutable proof that Khomeini was conducting a crime against humanity, as great as the Bataan Death March, worse than Srebrenica. So, and many, as you have said, James said it earlier, many of the top regime figures today were on the panels that personally asked people one or two questions and then sent them to their death. They were machine gunning people into swimming pools and draining the blood. They were hanging them from cranes six at a time. I apologize for the, the crude uh, language. But, but this is what they did. And so I'm saying these things because if our governments, if our foreign ministries had to speak in this language and had this evidence in front of them, how could they not take action? Why did Iran go nuclear? Do you, you know, the defense analysts always say, well, they couldn't have a conventional armed force. It was an unusual religious regime they had to defend against Israel. No. The real uh, indications are that because the, the supreme leader that they did choose Ali Khamenei was a Hojatol Islam, a low, not a high-ranking cleric, and was sort of promoted to Ayatollah and then Grand Ayatollah. He didn't have any charisma in the Shia world. Ayatollah Sistani of Iraq has never followed the supreme leader of Iran. The Hezbollah only follows them because they're on the payroll. There are no followers of this supreme leader in the religious world. And so the nuclear program was seen as a way to give the supreme leader a little bit more uh, credibility and a little more power. Why did they give half the economy to the IRGC in around 2005? Because as Ahmadinejad became president, the IRGC was getting fairly powerful. They were nervous about the loyalty of the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guards. So they gave them half of the economy as a bargain to say, we're in this together. And so they have been ever since. Why did they transfer the MEK from Camp Ashraf to Camp Liberty? I went to the UN and talked to an Undersecretary General and the things he said convinced me that he believed that these people were being brainwashed, that they couldn't be interviewed by the United Nations. But all the documentation you have found from UN envoys going in and out of Camp Ashraf says quite the opposite, that everyone seems to be able to do whatever they want. There are no issues. Our military soldiers who, who patrolled and were inside the camp um, saw absolutely no issues of human rights abuses. What you don't know is that the United Nations mission in Iraq was lying to, to New York. They were not letting the Secretary General know that in fact, Nouri al-Maliki was managing this in a very negative way. They, they sent false information to Paris and said, don't worry, Camp Liberty will be fine. It's a very spacious and green and wonderful place to go. You'll be fine. It'll be just like Camp Ashraf, which was a, a dreadful lie. So what you may not know, because the human rights uh, sort of the human rights official underneath the head of UNAMI, Tahar Mumedra, resigned in protest, wrote a book full of documentation showing that on at least five occasions, the transfers of the MEK that Secretary of State Clinton was overseeing from Camp Ashraf to Camp Liberty, at least five meetings were held in the Iranian embassy in Baghdad. And the ambassador was a Quds Force brigadier. I don't think anyone in Washington knew that. But that tells you something. Maliki oversaw several attacks against the MEK. Some of them, the worst one was buried because after they massacred 52 people on September 1, 2013, that day they announced that they were going to New York to talk to, to enter nuclear talks with America, which completely took over the headlines. No one even read about the massacre at Camp Ashraf. There were seven massacres at Camp Ashraf, over a th well over 1,000 wounded, 140 killed, and these were all uh, a disgrace because the Americans had pledged 
uh, to protect these people. Why did Iran shed so much blood in Syria? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I will give you my answer. Because the Arab Spring had taken down Mubarak, who just died, and Ben Ali in Tunisia, and it had hit Syria. And the Iranians had just had their crisis in 2009. They knew that if there was going to be some kind of constitutional process, as there should be under UN Resolution 2254, and if there was going to be a constitutional process in Iraq that would work, as the Americans tried to do, and we've made a lot of mistakes, but we tried, if those two situations had stabilized under constitutional processes, the mullahs knew that Tehran would fall the next day. So they went to the front lines of Syria, even though Bashar al-Assad was a secular, westernized dictator, who wasn't even, uh, it was a very, you know, uh, Alawite religion, it's not, it's, there's no resemblance to Khomeini's uh, Shia Islam. And they fought for him, and they died for him. And they recruited Shia militia from all over the Middle East, paid them, armed them, trained them, and committed massive war crimes, which are going on today in Idlib province in Syria. So this is why, if you look at each one of these things, why did they come to the table and negotiate a nuclear agreement? Why, did, why were they smiling whenever they delayed six months and they kept talking? They never stopped smiling because they needed the legitimacy of a negotiation to say, you see, we're sitting with the EU, we're sitting with Russia, with China, with all these countries, the P5 plus one. This is a perfectly, le we're a legitimate country. All of these, all of these are indications of a regime in dreadful fear of, of its legitimacy bringing it down the next day. And if you look at the, and I'll, I will finish in a moment, if you look at what Iran has been doing just for the last two years, you'd think that the United States and Canada and others have been committing all kinds of all kinds of transgressions and that we should be criticized and that the Iranians, we have to apologize for that. Who's been doing all of the transgressions? Who was, who was shooting at all the, and, and threatening the Gulf shipping? Who shot at the gathering station and cut off half of Saudi Arabia's uh, oil exports? Who has been firing 300 or more ballistic missiles from the Houthis into Saudi Arabia, including three the, the other day when Pompeo was in Saudi Arabia? Who has created displaced 5.6 million Syrians, killing over 500,000. And who, by the way, and this is where Zarif comes in, has allowed his embassies under the Vienna Convention to be a conduit for MOIS terror teams to be caught in Denmark, Belgium, France, Germany, Austria, and Albania within the last two years. Why isn't he being called to account for being a huge accomplice to terrorism? All of them are guilty, and I completely endorse what James said. Uh, and I have actually three, three recommendations. We've, we've talked about Soleimani. Yes, uh, he was a terrible man, but here's the point. We need an accountability initiative. You've take, one person has been removed from the board, but there are so many others who are, who are moving forward in malign ways. We need to identify them. We need to put the dossiers together. Look what happened with Milosevic and, and Radovich and Karatich. They all ended up in The Hague. They all ended up in jail. This is what needs to happen to the senior regime figures of Iran. <laughs> my, my second policy suggestion, and you'll know that I, here's a Washington person standing in the House of Commons in Canada begging for our, our, our reasonable neighbor to help us out here. The second idea is to look at what Soleimani's program was. Yes, he was a bad guy. What was his blueprint? What was he doing? What was the grand plan? Because if you just say, oh, we got this great general, he was so important to the supreme leader, but you have no idea what he was doing and why, then you've missed the whole point because they could lose Soleimani and they could still carry out his plan. He was executing Ayatollah Khomeini, not Khamenei, Khomeini's grand plan for a Shia caliphate, from Karbala to Quds to Jerusalem. He was the guy that was basically trying to use the Shia shrines and to take to buy their way into all of the, uh, the different houses around these shrines throughout the Middle East to, to, to basically surround any rival powers uh, and become the, essentially the hegemon, but a religious hegemon uh, consistent with Khomeini's view. Of course, they failed miserably. I, I, I come back to some of the things we heard uh, on, in the video and, and Senator Torricelli's speech. They've tried to do two things. They've tried to be a country. We look at them as the country of Iran. We see a map of Iran. 
But look at, they're not managing, look, look at the shoot down of the airplane, look at the water crisis, look at how they're handling coronavirus, look at everything they do. They don't care. They're not running a country. They're sort of saying, well, yes, this is the government of Iran, but they're actually trying to execute a regional caliphate, which is an infringement on everyone else's sovereignty, and has been right from the beginning. And th these are people who can't do one thing well, and they've certainly failed at trying to do two things here. So we need to understand the grand plan, and we need to talk to each other as governments on what measures can we take sensibly, without going to war, to frustrate the execution of the Soleimani Ayatollah Khomeini plan. We need to be strategic. And thirdly, I want to talk, my final word is about the media. You know, for many years, sitting in government, we always picked up the newspapers. In fact, back in the days when they printed them every morning, uh, in, in the vice president's office, we had a pile four inches high of all the articles that mentioned US policy and the president and the vice president. We don't burn that many, we don't kill that many trees these days. But we look at the media as if they probably have a, an honest handle, an honest take on the situation. But when it comes to Iran, ladies and gentlemen, they do not speak the truth. This is a very filtered, this is a very filtered view of Iran, which I believe involves self-censorship and a quiet, tacit compromise by major media organizations, including the New York Times, I'm sorry to say, and the BBC and others, who know that the minute they say any of the things I've told you, they'll never get another visa to Tehran. They'll never have a correspondent standing in the streets of Tehran reporting or interviewing the foreign minister or anyone else. They'll lose their access. So this is what you get. You get a false story. And here in Canada, you, you, know, you're, you, you should know something about this. I, I pulled up a wonderful copy of this November 17, 2001, Ottawa Citizen. Of course, if you go to the Ottawa Citizen files, this is, it's been erased, but others have kept it. They had a huge expose with two pages of images of how Saddam's nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, missiles were all in secret tunnels underneath Camp Ashraf in Iraq. The MEK was hiding everything Saddam had in the lead up to the Iraq war. Saddam's deadly secret. And of course, the entire thing was paid for by the Ministry of Intelligence. I think you need to understand that there are a lot of voices, some of them are in opposition groups, who have accommodated the regime or been infiltrated by the regime. And this is why the MEK has to be so careful with them. They only trust each other. People call them a cult, no. They've lost tens of thousands of relatives. They are in danger. Masoud Rajavi was chased by Scud missiles, F-4 airplanes, and you know assassins for 20 years, uh, in fact, Two of the first two of those accounted for the first two ceasefire violations of the Iran-Iraq war. The recent missile attack that led to the shootdown of the, of the aircraft was the third great violation by Iran of the Iran-Iraq ceasefire. The United States and Canada have been in Iraq under status of forces agreements. We're there legally. Now there may be some controversy in the parliament, but we're there legally. Iran is not. So we need to understand that we have to hold tight onto the facts, ladies and gentlemen because we're not gonna get them from the, from the news media until we demand that they admit the truth and we demand that the leaders of the Iran government answer for their actions and we demand that our foreign ministries stop hiding under the desk, come out, tell us the truth and then we can put together a sensible policy. I will tell you this, even when a country commits aggression and war, even when a country builds nuclear weapons, in international affairs, all the other countries can do is try to contain it, deter it, negotiate. They can't, it's, it's, not, it's not common for them to say, oh, I'm just going to go take the regime down. Uh, we, we, did, we did try that in 2003 with Saddam. But no, the protocols of international relations allow for quite a bit of, of aggression, unfortunately. But the one thing that international affairs has said no to is gross violations of human rights, something that here in Canada is a prime issue of concern. If you do your homework, if you pull the facts forward, if you reveal these facts and look at them, as you have in the lobby here, but go further and show how much propaganda, how much falsehood, how much deception this regime has put on as a way of evading responsibility for its gross violations of human rights, for its acts of war, uh, you, then I think we could be talking about 
international action to, con to take individuals to account for the bombings in Argentina, the machine gunning of the Kurdish separatists in Berlin, assassinations in the streets of Asia and the Middle East and Europe, you know, Qasem Rojavi in 1990 on the streets of Geneva, Paris assassinations. These are all by people who are still there. The Supreme Leader's defense uh, advisor is the man who was a brigadier in the Bekaa Valley who oversaw the bombing of the Marine Corps and the French. So he's still there. So there's a lot of accountability to be had. I think we could build a much better policy if we strip away the propaganda and we know that there's a deeper truth. And once we have that truth in hand, as Senator Torricelli has said, we can't be stopped. So good luck to all of our friends in the Iran resistance and the Iranian diaspora, and thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>